Welcome to Beyond the Unknown. I'm your host, Jolie. And I'm Quinn. And we're two sisters venturing into the podcast realm to share spine-tingling tales with listeners craving more spook in their week. Today, we're taking you on a journey to one of Scotland's most infamous graveyards that's home to a dark history including grave robbing, a makeshift prison, and more recently, a Harry Potter tour? This place... (laughs) gosh this place is called the greyfriars kirkyard all right in the heart of edinburgh greyfriars kirkyard is known to be a place teeming with restless spirits dating all the way back to the 16th century when the yards were used to bury thousands of victims that perished from the plague later on during the 17th century as scotland became rife with religious conflict due to the catholic protestant divide a group known as the covenanters who resisted the king's control over the church, had to endure brutal persecution. Their failed uprising during 1967 marked a dark chapter in Scottish history. The man responsible for the horrifying act of retribution against the Covenanters was called Sir George Mackenzie, or Sir George Bloody Mackenzie, or... When you were me reading it for the first time, you might have said Sir George Bluity Mackenzie because it was spelled <laughs> B-L-U-I-D-Y. But honestly, a lot of this spelling and pronunciation for Scottish and Irish things is quite different than it, it looks when it's written, when you, when you think of those, those names that some people have. So that's not surprising. Okay, yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one that thought that. Um, and this man was known as a merciless judge. After the Covenanters suffered a devastating defeat at the Battle of Bosworth Bridge, Mackenzie herded the survivors, around 1,200 people, so I don't know how you herd 1,200 people, must have had a big group. Simple process. Yeah, easy peasy. He herded these people into a section of Greyfriars Kirkyard, which is now known as the Covenanters' Prison, as they waited for their trials. So he essentially had 1,200 people in a makeshift prison with no shelter, which was essentially an open field between stone walls. These people were given insufficient amounts of food for four months, and many of the Covenanters perished before the end of winter. According to covenanter.org.uk, the prisoners were fed four ounces of bread a day, and sometimes kind citizens were able to give them more. (laughs) that's awful so i had to look up how much four ounces of bread was because i had no idea it's like you know is is that plenty for the day or is that a really low amount and it's basically 300 calories a day which kind of immediately puts you into starvation mode yeah that's literally not even close to enough i mean i don't have much of a frame of reference for what four ounces of anything is but that's awful (laughs) and bread is like no nutritional content so yeah yeah the conditions at this prison were so poor that it was considered to be one of the world's first concentration camps if those didn't perish from poor conditions and malnutrition they either escaped were executed for treason or lucky enough to be freed if they signed a bond of loyalty to the crown 257 remaining in this prison were sentenced to indentured servitude in America. Do you know what indentured servitude is? Nope, not at all. So it's a fancy term for forced labor, but not quite slavery because you actually have a debt to pay off. But the debt could be unknown and it could just last forever and, you know, you're, ba- you're basically a slave. Uh, I like to say it's rebranded slavery, but with just a debt. I literally don't understand how America has their hand in this, because isn't this happening in Scotland? Yeah, you're totally right. This is happening in Scotland. However, slave trading is alive and well at this uh, in this time and period. And America is a very high buyer. Okay, okay. Anyways, back to the Covenanters who were shipped to American colonies. Only a few were able to escape a watery grave because their ship was wrecked during a storm off of the coast of Orkney Islands, which is a cluster of islands in the north of Scotland. There were only 48 survivors out of the 257 that got on this boat, and all but those who did not survive the shipwreck were laid to rest in a mass grave 
back within the kirkyard. Okay, so the church basically had a cemetery along with it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I... I think I mentioned this at the start, but really briefly. um, Before these prisoners were brought there and it was used as a prison yard, it was also a grave site, and they had thousands of bodies of those who perished from the Black Plague already resting there, but maybe not in the exact same area. They weren't, like, standing on top of graves, I don't think. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Makes it a bit better. Yeah, a little. After this tragedy, and to many surprise, Mackenzie continued to serve in office, publishing books on religion, philosophy, and the monarchy. He's a well-rounded guy. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) well-rounded. I mean, he's got so many talents. Probably had a TED Talk. (laughs) In 19... Nope. 1600s. <laughs> nope, sorry. Yeah, just a few back hundred it up, years back earlier. It up. Yeah. <laughs> in 1689, he founded the Advocates Library, and then in 1691, he passed away. Whoa. So he was doing stuff up right until the end. Yeah, like he put that library out, and then it, it basically killed him. Yeah. <laughs> His final resting place was in a grand mausoleum within Greyfriars Kirkyard, the very cemetery where the imprisoned Covenanters had once endured such torment. That sounds like a recipe for disaster when it comes to spirits and things that are just generally not happy. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you wait for it. Fun fact, I think Sir George Bloody Mackenzie's mausoleum is maybe one of the most tattered buildings within Greyfriars Kirkyard. I've read that the stone doesn't get cleaned by staff out of respect for those that were killed by his at his will. Um, so let me show you what it looks like. Oh, that is quite the mausoleum, though. Like, it's quite the structure. It's a house. We'll put this uh, photo on our website and Instagram, too. Way after Sir George Mackenzie's death in the early 19th century, this graveyard became popular for something other than the Covenanter's prison and Black Plague victims. Can you guess what it was? No, like maybe a hospital, a school? (laughs) No, grave robbing. Oh, sorry, I totally missed the mark. I thought it was like, what are they using it for? Like, not what did people Oh, come? sorry. Just because I feel like that uh, space has been multi-purposed. It was a basically prison, a church, a graveyard. I thought, what else? But okay, that makes sense. People were grave robbing. There was a lot of graves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And do you know why they were grave robbing? Oh, I assume the bodies were buried with things of importance, like metals and things. You'd think that would have been more popular, but this was actually the height of improving our understanding of the human body, and to do that, they needed bodies. Oh my. But not just any old body. They needed freshly buried bodies. So, late at night, resurrectionists, or night doctors, which are way fancier term, uh, terms for grave robbers, would dig up bodies and sell them to individuals, using them for medical training purposes, like medical schools or schools of anatomy. (gasps) What? They didn't check their sources. They're like, yeah, you got this random body? Not worried at all how you got your hands on this. Let's check it out. Yeah, well, I think it was, it just became so popular so fast that it, everyone was trying to like sell bodies. And then eventually, because grave robbing was such an issue then they started to like kind of regulate it but first when you needed bodies and you were getting them left right and center why question it but as a medical school like a an important establishment they weren't questioning the source of all these abundant supply of bodies (laughs) to me that sounds crazy maybe and as someone who went to medical school quite recently you might think that they have higher standards but when we're talking like early 1800s medical schools were probably not as sophisticated oh for sure i think like hand washing became a thing much later but i guess i just thought you know there's just certain things as a human being no matter what century you might be kind of curious about (laughs) (laughs) like where'd this dead body come from but okay all right except first ask question second (laughs) yeah you gotta do what you gotta do 
Due to the increase in body snatching, the Greyfriars installed mort safes, which were iron bars covering graves so people couldn't get to the bodies because body snatching or, you know, grave robbing, digging was such an issue. So I'm going to show you a picture of mort safes because I've, I don't think I've ever seen them before and I've never heard of them. And when I saw them, I was like, huh. I don't think I've seen them either. I feel like I have a can kind of picture, but oh, not at all what I was picturing. Ah, uh, that one picture there, second down on the left there. I get, I get, I feel like I might have seen something like that at, at some point in my life. Hmm. But yeah, but they're very, yeah, kind of creepy looking, especially because they just outlined the grave itself, so it's like kind of body shaped, so it's creepy. Yeah. I don't like that. And I want to know how far down they go. Like, I, I need to find something on how they installed it because I don't understand how someone couldn't just dig like a foot lower. Yeah, you just go around it or pluck it up off the ground. Like if you have some help or yeah. attached to a horse, tow it away. <laughs> I don't know. It just doesn't seem that safe. Yeah, I'd agree. But I guess it did the trick. So if anyone knows how mort safes were buried, please let us yeah. know because I'm dying to know. I'm intrigued. With thousands of bodies being buried over three centuries, the big question is, did these spirits ever move on after passing? I'd say probably not. The notable hauntings all started in 1999 when a homeless man seeking shelter disturbed Sir George Mackenzie's tomb, unleashing the vengeful Mackenzie poltergeist upon site visitors. Something sad about this was the individual was seeking shelter, obviously. He didn't mean to wake a vengeful spirit. But when he broke into the tomb, he actually, like, I don't know how the mausoleum or, like, the tomb of um, Sir George Mackenzie's laid out, but I guess he somehow, like, fell into a little pit of um, still decomposing plague victim bodies. <gasps> oh. So did he get the plague then? I'm not sure. I didn't see anything saying that he did get it or like perished from it or anything. But that's probably the scariest thing to happen to you. That's awful. I'm guessing though, since this is the first like known disturbance of his tomb, that uh, chaos is about to ensue. Oh yeah. By 2006... There were over 450 recorded attacks attributed to this malevolent spirit. That sounds about right. Yeah. Encounters with the ghost in the Covenanter's prison or mausoleum were marked not only by pushing or scratching, but also by reports of bruises, burns, and even a broken finger. Is it poltergeist or is that a demon? I have no idea. That almost sounds borderline like demonic. What I don't understand is, though, is why is he so malevolent? What's he mad about? He's the one that went around killing everyone else, built a museum. He was writing things. He seemed like he was educated. Like, what's what's his problem? He lived his best life until the very end. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was just, you know, how dare you break into my mausoleum? I'm King B. I'm, I'm the shit. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Like, he's just ruling the roost, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to say I'd like to think that it's all of the other spirits that were actually tortured and murdered at his hand, but I don't know why they would be awoken by this event. Well, maybe they were resting peacefully and then when he got out, every just chaos, like you maybe. know, they were upset to have encountered one another again or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. What's even more chilling and my personal worst nightmare is that Mackenzie's spirit, or whatever spirit this is, um, is believed to have the ability to leave the graveyard and attach itself to visitors, following them home and continuing its attacks. In two reported cases, alleged encounters with the ghost led to psychiatric hospitalization for the victim. That is literally also my personal worst nightmare. Like, the main reason yeah. why I would be afraid to visit some of these really haunted places? Like, no thanks. Because anything that would ever happen to me from that point forward, I would be like, well, it must be the spirit. He's with me. Yeah. And then, you know, you don't know when they've like picked up and, you know, attached 
uh, hitched a yeah. ride back home. How long are they there? Who knows? Who knows? It depends know. how long they got a visa for. <laughs> you know, they got to go, they got to do their paperwork. <laughs> Ministry of Ghosts and Ghouls <laughs> is like two weeks max from this location. <laughs> you got to come back. You've committed too many crimes. Is this a work visa or a <laughs> business or pleasure? It's well monitored. <laughs> yeah. The ones that go on like um, Zach Baggins. Uh, what's it? What's that show called? Oh my gosh. Uh, Ghost Hunters Hunt- International. Hunters? Yeah. They have ghosts that travel <laughs> with them and they're like a uh, purely business. Yeah, that's, they get a work visa for sure. Sometimes those can be even harder to get though. <laughs> City of the Dead Tours, a company specializing in tours of the Mackenzie Poltergeist and Greyfriars Kirkyard ground, keep a record of these injuries. Its founder, Jan Andrew Henderson, is allegedly a victim of the Mackenzie Poltergeist himself. And in one extreme case, Henderson's apartment burned down <laughs> while he lived next to the graveyard and worked on a book about the entity. It burned to the ground. Not extreme. <laughs> yeah. Burned to the ground <laughs> while he was writing a book about this. Okay. No big deal. Yeah. That's a message if I ever heard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Despite initially keeping an open mind, Henderson eventually ceased leading tours and moved to Australia. And for anyone wondering, City of the Dead Tours is still running. Well, I'm not going to be joining that. And uh, who knows? I bet you the Boulder guys latched on and took a little trip down to Australia. They probably did. Although you might not be interested in that tour, they do have some other tours going on on the grounds that might be more your thing. And I'm not sure if it's City of the Dead that's running them or another group, but there are some Harry Potter related tours. (laughs) (laughs) What? Yeah. Where many fans um, visit this graveyard because there's some graves of interest, like ones with the names Thomas Riddle and another one where an individual has the last name Potter. Um, I think it has really no relation to the book other than the coincidental naming, but people who are diehards will, of course, go there, and then there are certain grave sites people take pictures with. That's kind of interesting, though, because that the Thomas Riddle name, like, I mean, all these names could be, people could have them, but yeah. And I think I've read somewhere that, I'm not sure if it was Greyfriars Kirkyard, or other places nearby Edinburgh with, um, you know, similar architecture kind of inspired J.K. Rowling's vision for Hogwarts. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but perhaps the most tragic incident linked to the Mackenzie poltergeist was the death of spiritualist medium Colin Grant in 2000. Grant died of a heart attack during a seance, just weeks after attempting to exercise the vengeful spirit. He had expressed his fears that his efforts to rid the entity might ultimately claim his life. And sadly, that might just have. Now, that's absolutely wild. Like, how, I wonder how he knew, like, or was had that vibe that it was going to end his life. Yeah, I have no idea. I wonder how many he's done, what his age was, all things I could have looked up. You know, sometimes when people are doing exorcism type things, there that is always a risk of an exorcism is death. Yeah. And so I wonder what about what's happening about the seance that could possibly have given him that vibe that it might end his life and then he did have a heart attack. Or is he someone that, you know, would get some chest pains, possibly had a poor cardiac history and just thought he was going to die because that's a feeling you get when you have heart problems sometimes. Yeah. Maybe that one. No. But I'm going to lean on the, the speech here. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. So, if you're daring enough to seek a glimpse of this malevolent presence, you'll need to plan your excursion carefully. To deter vandals, the Covenanters' prison and Mackenzie's mausoleum remain locked up, only accessible through official tour visits, which are hard to find. Well, that wraps up our journey into the spooky history of Greyfriars Kirkyard. We hope you enjoyed this chilling trip to Scotland's past and present. Thanks for joining us on Beyond the Unknown. If you have a ghost story or any mysterious encounters of your own, please email us at moody.mediaprod at gmail.com. You can reach out on our website, and who knows, maybe your story might be featured in our next episode. 
All of our sources for this episode can be found on our website, beyondtheunknownpod.com. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, listeners, stay curious and remember that the unknown is always just beyond the shadows.